start. Amen. All right. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to feel the presence of God in his house. To me, that's what makes going to church special. Just going through a building once a week doesn't do nothing. But when you enter into the presence of God, it can change your life. It can change everything about you. It can change your direction. It can change your hope. It can change your life. It can touch your body. It can change your family. It's amazing what we can accomplish when we get into the presence of God. Amen. And that's what this whole Bible series that we're talking about, this message series we're going through, is a story of glory. A story of glory. And if you have your Bible with me today... I'm going to be reading out of Exodus, if my tablet will cooperate. We must have a good one on the way because everything's, my throat's breaking down, everything <laughs> happened this morning, but that's okay. But we're going to go to Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18 through 23. And we've read this for the past two Sundays. We've been talking about the glory of God and about how important it is to have the glory of God in the house of God. Because there's a lot of man's glory in the house of God in the modern day we live in. A lot of man's intu intuition, a lot of, of man's experience, and, and a lot of man's showmanship. And that's wonderful and great. But that doesn't help nobody. That doesn't help us. That doesn't deliver us from our sin. That doesn't get us closer to God. Right. That doesn't get us to the place where we need to be in the Lord. We need a, a, a regiment, not just every now and again, but a regiment of being in the glory of God. Because I learned a long time ago, I learned from my parents, that who you hang out with, you begin to act like. Amen? Amen. If you hang out with the devil all week, you're going to act like the devil. Amen. If you hang out with the Lord all week, you're going to act like the Lord. Amen. So that's why we've got to have the glory of God back in our presence and back in the house of God. Amen. So we're taking this series out of Moses' experience. Moses saw a lot of things as a child of Israel, as a deliverer of Israel, out of the bondage of Egypt. He saw a burning bush talk to him. He saw a manna from heaven. He saw the Red Sea split. He saw so many miracles, but he comes to this point in his life in Exodus 33, verse 18, and he says this. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Show me more, God. Show me more than what I've ever seen. And he said, I will make all my goodness Pass before thee. And we taught about that on the first Sunday. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. We taught about that last Sunday. About how amazing it is when we come into the glory of God. We learn more about him. We learn more of who he is in our life. And today we're going to be picking up with uh, uh, the next part. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou cannot see my face. For there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And we talked about what glory actually means. That little word glory has a great big definition. It has a big definition, and I'm going to read some of it to you. It means fame. It means prestige, celebrity. It means to possess brilliance, excellence, power. It means to possess beauty, majesty. When we talk about the glory of God, what we just sang about, about the glory of God being here and his presence, it's not just a goosebump. It's not just a feeling. It's not God doesn't show up just so we can shout a lot. God shows up to do work. God's glory is here to make people whole, to bring them out of their bondage, to break their sin, so that they can know him more. Amen. We've got a lot of churches today that they're programmed towards the flesh. They're programmed to tickle the flesh, to tickle the ear. They're, they're programmed to make you feel good but in, in your flesh, but your soul is sick. It's sin sick. It's still bound up. It still has problems. It still has issues. It still has pain. It still has hurt. The only thing that can break that is to get into the glory of God. And the glory of God can mend those wounds. He can do those things. He can touch those scars that nobody else sees. That's why the glory of God is important. And today we're going to be talking and picking up where God makes a revelation to Moses in the process of answering his question. He begins to tell Moses, he says, I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Those are important words because God is speaking about something that is to come. God is revealing something to Moses 
in a dispensation of God that Moses had not been in yet. Because Moses was the law. God had just given him the law. God had just said, these are the commandments. You have to abide in them. If you break them, it means death. It means they will stone you. It means things will happen. But God says, I want you to know, Moses, I'm not about just being evil. I'm not about just being hateful. I'm not about just putting a bunch of rigid laws that there is a side of me that you need to know. And it's my side of grace. It's my side of mercy. God's grace and his mercy is found in his glory. Yes. Hallelujah. It's found in his glory. And here's the great thing. God does not say you have to be qualified to enter into his grace and his mercy. His grace and his mercy qualifies you. Hallelujah. That's your shouting point. You missed it. Some of you think, well, I want this glory of God. I want this power of God to be in me. I want to hear from God. I want to know God more. I want to feel his presence. I want to be sensitive to what God is doing. You want those things in your life, but you have already disqualified yourself because you're thinking, well, I'm not as good as pastor. I'm not as good as them, and I can't get there because they do it better than me. They live better than me. They talk better than me. They know more of the Bible than me, and I just can't get there. No, God says, my grace is for whoso. Whoever will, let him come. God doesn't wait for you to qualify yourself in your own goodness to experience the grace and mercy of God. That's a wonderful thing. The grace and mercy of God is there so you can understand the love of God. Now, grace is not an opportunity to sin, and we'll get into that in a minute. Grace isn't something that we say, well, we got into the grace of God now so I can act like a heathen and go to heaven. That's not what grace is. No, no. No. God's grace, the Bible says that God gave us grace teaching us yes. to deny ungodliness and to embrace true holiness. It's just like raising a child. Whenever I've got three of them, and when you raise them, you begin to say, no, you cannot do this. No, you cannot behave this way. Hopefully, you do that with your kids, because if not, you're raising the devil. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Restriction, borders. Uh, commands, those are important to say no. Say, hey, you can't do, let, do that. You can't behave that way. You can't stay up all night. You got school in the morning. You can't eat whatever you want. You got to be healthy. We do these as parents, but we do it because we want them to learn it. Yes. And when they make a mistake, we don't just kick them out. No. We bring them back in. That's grace. And we say, no, no, let my grace, hey, I'm going to be, I'm going to be gracious to you right now. I'm going to, I'm going to give you another shot at it. I'm going to give you another chance right. to get it right. That's what grace and mercy is. I want to read to you a few things in the word of God about God's mercy and his grace. Psalm 103, verse 8 through 17. This is a big portion, but, but there's no way I could eliminate any part of it. The Bible says this. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, yes. slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Can I tell you right now, God is not mad at you. Amen. God is not angry at you. God is not upset at you. God isn't up there just gritting his teeth saying, boy, I can't wait till their number comes up so I can kick them into hell. Because, boy, they've had it coming for years. That is not your God. That is not the God of the Bible. I know that's what the world wants you to make, make you think that that's what God is, but he's not. He's very slow to anger. And thankfully so, because if not, he would have struck me down a long time ago. Amen. Amen. He's slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. You're never going to wear out the mercy of God. You're never going to get to the point where God's not up there with a clicker saying, well, they've asked forgiveness for 5,573 times. God didn't have a clicker in heaven. He's not keeping score. He's not up there saying, but if they get to six million, I'm not doing it anymore. They get to six million and one, and I'm cutting them off. No, you had six million chances to get it right, and now you didn't. That is not your God, but that's some of the times the way we feel like God treats us. We feel like if we made a mistake when we go to God, we're like, well, God's never going to forgive me because this is like the tenth time I've had to ask him to forgive me if it's one thing. Guys, you're not, you're not uh, weak. You're not different. You're, you're, you're not a less than saint. You're just a human being trying to grow in grace. Keep going to the throne. Keep going to mercy. Keep going to him. I promise you, you'll get stronger. Yes. You'll get stronger. And before you know it, that temptation that keeps wrecking you eventually won't have the hold on you that it once had. The strength of God. But you've got to hang out with God. Yes. You've got to be in the glory of God. You've got to let him pour stuff into you. Yes. 
That's what grace is. He says, I'm, sl- I'm plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Praise God. God don't deal with me according to my mistakes. Amen. Amen. If he did, nobody would ever, ever live. We'd all be consumed. We'd all been swallowed up by now. If God would have dealt with you and me according to our sins. Jesus dealt with our sin. Jesus took our sin to the, to, to the tree. He nailed it, removing it forever. But when God looks at you, I don't care what you've done this morning. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what your record is. It doesn't matter. If you say, well, I'm on a, on a real, you know, hell-bent kind of way, Pastor, and I'm breaking laws and commandments every second of every day, I can tell you right now, God is not going to say, you're too far out there for me to help. All right. He's not going to deal with you according to your mistakes. He's going to deal with you according to what he's done for you. And that is give his own son to bear your sins and to make a way out. For the Bible says this in verse 11. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. Next time you feel like you've made a mistake too bad and you can't ask God forgiveness, just go outside and look up. And look how big the sky is. Look how far you can see. Amen. God says, my mercy is bigger than that. My mercy is bigger than that. And the thing about the sky is it keeps on going. We can only see it to a certain point, but it keeps on going. They keep on finding more galaxies and more galaxies out there. Man, it's everywhere. God's mercy is bigger than that. Amen. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath God removed the transgressions from us. Praise God. Amen. East and west, the good old story. You can go north and north and north, but eventually you'll hit the North Pole and you'll start going south. But if you go east and go east and go east and go east, you're never going to start going west. Amen. All right. You're going to keep on going east and you'll go around the planet a million times, but you're going to keep on going east. You know why? Because east and west never touch. Right. When the Bible says he separated my sins as far away as the east is from the west, yeah. they haven't touched yet yes. and they never will. Amen. They never will touch. I can keep going east and east. You can keep going and getting better for God and stop looking back thinking your sin is going to come and touch you. It will never. God separates us so far from our mistakes that that's how great his grace is. It's wonderful. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembered that we are dust. Praise the Lord. Out of all the scriptures, I think that's my favorite one. You say, that one really? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, God still knows that I'm just a pile of dust without yes. him. Yes. I'm just a pile of dirt. I'm nothing without him. We weren't anything without him. We never will be. God made man out of the dust of the earth. He made it. He breathed into it. He's well aware of my infirmity. He's well aware of my weaknesses. He's well aware of where I come short. And yet he loves me the same. Yet he's for me. He's not against me. He wants me to succeed. He wants me to be found in his glory. So he's made a way for us. As for man, his his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourished. For the wind passes over it and it's gone. And the place thereof shall shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto his children's children. The mercy and grace of God is forever. Don't think you've sinned away your opportunity to get right with God. Don't think that you've got three strikes and you're out. With man, this is the case. With your family, this is the case. With the law, this is the case. You only get so many mess-ups, and then you're done. So many mess-ups with your family. You can make so many mistakes that you lose your marriage, that you lose your children, that you lose your job, that you lose your freedom and get locked up. There's a lot of things you can lose to this point, but you cannot lose the love of God. You cannot lose the mercy of God. Now, God's not going to keep you in your sin. He's going to bring you out of your sin. But don't ever think you can't go to him and say, God, I messed up. I need you one more time. That's as much a part of the glory as anything else. Amen. Amen. 
So why is it such an important uh, uh, point to make out, Pastor? Because we get into a place sometimes as seasoned saints that we think the glory is just for us. We think it's just for the ones that, that know him real well. That's just for the ones that's been behaving all week long. That's just the ones that, you know, the, the, the real good Christians. Which, by the way, there's no such thing. <laughs> you're either a Christian or you're not. If you're not a good Christian, you're a good sinner. Amen. That's a different sermon for a different day. <laughs> I want you to know that when the glory of God shows up, the reason why we need it to show up in Northgate is because not just so the saints can shout, but so that the sinner can be saved, so that the sinner can find God. Because the glory shows up not just for us to hoop and holler and shout and run, but the glory of God shows up because someone here might not know God. Somebody here might be far away from the cross. And God says, I need them to experience my glory, the mercy of my glory, the grace of my glory, so they know they can still come home. Amen. 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 And I guarantee you, if you're here today and you say, I am saved and I know what you're talking about, it was because the glory of God opened the door of grace to you. Amen. Yes. Let's keep going. Exodus chapter 33, verse 20 21. This is the next thing God said to him. God said, Thou cannot see my face, for thus shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and shall stand upon a rock. I want to talk to you about what God said when he says, There shall no man see me and live. He said, Well, Pastor, you're just going to contradict yourself because you just told us that God wants us in his presence. Yes, he does. God, Moses, God just told Moses, Moses, I'm going to be gracious to you. I'm going to be merciful to you because it's within my power to do it. But you can't see my face. You say, what do you mean? Does that mean we shouldn't seek the face of God? No, you should always seek the face of God. What he was making here was Moses, understand, Moses right now, even where he stood, was a great man, a good man, but he was under the law. There was no redemption of the blood of Jesus Christ yet. He had no grace. That he, there wasn't an invitation for him to come boldly into the presence of God. Right. God's presence was a scary, fearful thing. And uh-huh. people could drop dead right. at the point of it. Amen. But what we can learn from this is, yes, God was telling Moses, Moses, I love you and I care about you. And, 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 I, and I want you to get what you're asking for. I want you to have the glory of God. But understand, your carnal self can't handle the glory of God. Neither Amen. can it enter into it. Say, what do you mean? Your carnal mind hinders your sight of God's glory. It always will. If you come to church in the flesh, then all you're going to get out of it is fleshly things. Amen. Amen. That's why some people can go home shouting and others go home pouting. (laughs) There's some people go home, man, that was awesome. God was awesome. He was in the place. Boy, I felt his glory. I felt his presence from the first amen to the last one. Man, I just felt God over that place. And you're like... Well, I was just hungry all day long, and I figured, man, when's he going to stop? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He lost me on that one point, and I don't know what he was saying. And I zoned out for a while and started thinking about my taxes and i got to run to the bank and i got to do that. And, man, God, he's still going. Man, it's almost noon. When's this dude going to shut up? Right. Amen. What happened in that moment? It wasn't that God got boring. It wasn't that the message got boring. It didn't mean that the word didn't work. It didn't mean you need to find a new church. What you need is to kill your flesh. What you need to do is get in the spirit of God. You need to come to the house of God in spirit and in truth. When you come to this place, I'm not here to give you a show. I'm not here for a pep talk. I'm not here to make you feel warm and fuzzy inside. I'm here to get you to God. That's my only job. That's my only role is to say, here is God. Come see him. Come feel him. Come hear him. That is the role of the minister. I'm not here to be a celebrity. I'm not here to be famous. I'm here to say thus, say the Lord. If you'll do that, if you'll come in with that kind of attitude, God will touch you. God will show up and he'll do something in your life. But if you come looking for fleshly things, you're going to leave disappointed. You're going to leave and say, well, I didn't get nothing out of that. Those songs they sang were too old. Well, maybe instead of criticizing them, start singing them. Amen Amen to that. 
Amen? Amen. I don't like it. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. Can I tell you, when you get in the Spirit of God, there's a lot of things that kind of leave. When you get in the Spirit of God, a lot of those complaints and murmurings, they thought they don't have a place. I can tell you, if I got in my flesh, I would be telling these people all the time, turn the air down, turn the air down, turn the air down, because I'm sweating like a pig up here, and I need somebody to pour ice on me. But that's my flesh. I can get up here and preach for an hour, sometimes two if I want to, and just keep going and going and going. But the minute I stop, the minute I come back to Chad, and I'm not dealing in the spirit anymore, and I'm in my carnality, that's when I'm like, oh, God, it's so hot in here. Oh, my goodness, I'm dying. Because there's a certain thing when you get in the spirit of God, all those little nuances of the flesh that get in the way, they fade away. They go away. And you don't look at the clock. And you don't worry about tomorrow. You just say, I'm in the presence now. That's what I mean by your carnal self. Amen. You want to get in the spirit more? Stop listening to Conway Twitty until you get to the parking lot and then come in here and sing how great thou art. Oh, you're meddling now, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. Amen. We want to squeeze as much spirit out of God, but we don't want to give him any part of our flesh. We don't want him to squeeze any of our flesh out. We just want God to give me everything he got and make it happen by noon because I got stuff to do. That's carnality. Amen. What God was telling Moses, say, listen, if you approach me with that stuff, I'll kill it. I'll kill it. When you enter into the glory of God, God kills your flesh. He kills it. He, he makes it die because it cannot live in his presence. All right. If you want to lay down some of those habits and hang up that you've got, some of those little things that you can't let go of, stop thinking that one day I'm going to preach them away. I can't. But what you can do is you can get in the glory of God. And as you get in the glory of God, God will kill it inside of you. Because that's what his glory can do. And that's what he was telling Moses. He was like, that flesh you got can't see who I really am. And if you want to come to the house of God and get something out of the singing, the teaching, the preaching, then you've got to put your spirit on and in truth worship God. Amen. And not care about the temperature, the clock. What's happening after? Where are you going to go out and eat? How, how, how uncomfortable the seat is? Or, or where you got to park? Or where you didn't get to park? <laughs> or where you didn't get to seat? You know? Right. That was my seat. They should know. I've been here. It's my seat. Give up your seat. Amen. It don't belong to you anyway. It belongs to God. Amen. 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 Okay, I got no more. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, 12. If you want scripture to back up what I'm saying. It says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Right. Now I know in part, but then I will know even as I am known. Yes. I can't see God fully in this flesh. Right. That's why I have to enter with, in the spirit and worship him in the spirit because my flesh will never get it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, Amen. for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I've heard people make fun of what we do in here. Why you go there and listen to that dude? That's foolishness. Yeah, it is, because God made it that way. Yeah. Foolishness. Science will even tell you the worst way to learn anything is to hear audibly, like I'm doing right now. Your brain is programmed to learn better visually or actually interacting. Uh -huh. But actually hearing it from a voice is the worst way ever. God said, that's the way I'm going to pick it. That's what I'm going to do. That's right. Because they say that it's better this way, it's better that way. I'm going to do it this way and show them that I can do it however I want to do it. All right. That's the God you serve. Yeah. God loves doing that thing. But understand, when we come in here, yeah, you may think some of us, if you're new here and you don't know us too well, you may think, well, maybe they're kind of crazy. They're a little bit loud in there and they like to raise their hands and maybe they like to shout a little bit or talk a little bit. Don't think we're weird. Don't think we're crazy. Don't think we've lost our mind. We're, we're just doing the foolish things for God because we are the foolishness of God. I know that God called me in the foolishness because I was a fool all my life. There ain't nothing that qualified me to do this. Amen. Nothing. And God said, I'm going to take that joker and turn him into a preacher. Amen. I'm living proof. Amen. But see, you can hold yourself out of the glory of God because in your carnal self, you're like, 
well, I want to raise my hand, but I don't want to look weird. You just lost the battle of spirit and flesh. All right. Well, he says to come up to the altar, but I don't want to go up there. People will look at me. You just lost the battle between spirit and flesh. I don't see why I gotta go up there. It's not about coming here. There's nothing magical about this place up here. That's same right. carpet down here that there is up by your feet. That's it's right. the same thing. Yeah, that's right. Well, why do we gotta do it, Pastor? I don't know why, but I just know what God says. God says lay hands on each other. God says pray for one another. God says tarry at the altar. God says these things. God says lift up holy hands unto God. God says this stuff. God says shout unto God with a voice of triumph. God says this stuff. And the reason why we do it is because he said to do it. And if the world calls me foolish, so well, I don't care what the world calls me. I just care what he calls me. Amen. Amen. You got to get in the spirit. Romans 8, 5 and 6 says it this way. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I've heard people say, oh, well, they're, you know, always just floating on a cloud. Well, I'd rather be floating on a cloud than dying in a ditch. You can call me too churchy. That's okay. You can call me Holy Roller. You can say, well, he's always a spirit. Everything he talks about is about God and Jesus and God and Jesus. And, you know, he's always just bringing Jesus into everything. I can't help it. He's in here. Yes. And the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes. He's very abundant in my heart. Oh. Very abundant. Yes. He's abundant. He's giving me life full of abundance. Yes. And he's in here. So I can't help but talk. We might start talking about the weather, but we're probably going to end up in Genesis somewhere. We might start talking about sports, but we'll probably end up in Revelation. I don't know where we're going to end up, but that's where we're going to go. Because it's in here. Yes. Because those things are spiritually discerned. I didn't get that from going to Bible college. I didn't get that from book learning. No, I got that from hanging out with the God who created me. Amen. That time I'm doing. Okay, good. <laughs> Want to talk to you in the next part? Right after this part when he says, I will be gracious and I will be merciful. He says something that's very important. And this is going to be the last point I make today because it's very important. He says to Moses, he says, behold, there is a place by me. Yes. Behold, there is a place by me. Let's talk about your and my place by God. Because you have a place by him that no one can stand in but you. Nobody can stand in your spot. Nobody can appear in the glory of God in your plot, in your spot but you. You got a designated spot that's got your name on it. And any time you want to enter in, it's your spot to claim. It's yours. It belongs to you. I can't take it. I can't say, well, that's my spot too because I was better than them this week and I prayed more and I gave more and I was more obedient, so I get their spot too. No, no, no. God says, I have a spot for all of mine, a very special spot for just you. And you say, even me, I'm full of sin and rebellion. It does not matter. God made a place for you. It's in his presence. Amen. Ephesians 2, 5 through 7 says it this way. It says, even when we were dead in sins. That means when you were in the height of your sin career. That day that you hope nobody knows what you did that day. That day is when this happened. He says he has quickened us together with Christ. What does that word quicken mean? It means cause to come to life. To put life in. He says, even when you were at your most dead place. I've made a place of life for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. And it's together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I've got a place where I can ascend. Not in the flesh. Not in I'm not going to be hovering over my house. No, I'm not there. But my spirit can ascend and sit by my Lord and Savior at the right hand of the Father. In Christ Jesus, there's a place for me and you. Amen. Amen. 
Why do we have that? This is why, because in verse 7 it says, that in the ages to come, that means 2019, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Why does God have a place for you? Why does God have a spot for you? Because before you ever were, he knew you. He planned your life out. He has a plan and a goal and a purpose, a thing that he created you for. And when he thought of you, when he th thought of who you were going to be, he said, this is Chad's spot. This is where he goes. My will is for him to get there. My will is for him to stay there. This is where I want him to be. I had to choose it. I had to follow him. I had to accept his love. But that spot is still mine. Amen. How do you know it's still mine? Because I left him. I walked astray. I went out into the world and I did all craziness. I did all manner of junk. But when I came back to him, he didn't say, nope, sorry, I gave your spot away to someone else. No, he said, come on home, son. I still got your spot. It's still right here. It's right next to me. It's in my presence. You've got a spot in God that nobody can take but you. Why is that important to know? Because if God's going to change your life, you got to get to your spot. I can't get you to your spot for you. you got to get there right. on your own. The Spirit of God will lead you. The grace of God will catch you. Yeah. But it is a decision you got to make. Amen. Yes. you got to say, God, I'm ascending to my spot. It's right there where it is. Even the disciples understood that there's a spot for them. Yes. The sons of thunder got their mama involved. Uh, right. You know they meant business when they had mama come and talk to Jesus. Yeah. Read your Bible. James and John brought their mother to Christ. Two lily livers to probably ask for it for themselves. They said, Mom, go talk to him. And Miss Zebedee, whatever, she went up to him and said, Hey, Jesus, I want my son's spots to be one on each side of you. Jesus didn't say, well, they ain't got no spot. What are you talking about, lady? Huh? He didn't deny they had a spot. He said, but the spot is not mine to give. The Father is going to designate the spot. I can't tell you where they're going to sit. But I promise you, I don't care if I'm sitting in the nosebleeds of glory. I'm going to be glad I'm there. I'm going to be glad I'm there. Hey, I don't need to have a front row seat. To see it all. I can see it in my mind. I can feel it in my heart. I know where he is. He testifies that I'm his own. I know where my spot is. I've had to go there many, many times saying, God, I got to find the glory again. I got to get to where I can feel you again. I got to get to the place where I can find strength that I don't have. Yes. Amen. There's a spot, there's a place for you in God's glory. He's just waiting for you to accept it. He's waiting for you to say, this is my spot. Yes. Amen. And you got to claim it. Sister, will you come play for me? There's a spot. And believe me, sometimes the devil's tried to talk me out of it. And told me, no, you've too made too many mistakes. you messed it up too many times. You failed. God gave me a shot to be a minister and you blew it. I've had that conversation a million times. Don't think just because you follow God that you're perfect all the time. You're not. You make mistakes. I don't have an active sinful lifestyle. I don't actively sin. I don't get up in my day thinking, well, God, I'm not going to let you touch this habit or this thing I've got. No, that's not my mentality at all. But I do live in a world that's fallen and it's got me sometimes. It's put me to my knees. It's, it's, it, it, it has done everything but, but caused me, and to some point, borderline of just backsliding. Totally turning my back on God and saying, I'm done. I'm done trying. I've done that. Well, was that before you got saved? No, that was why I'm pastoring churches. That's why I'm preparing to preach and teach to other people. Amen. You say, well, you ought to be holier than that. Guys, there's no holiness in me. Other than Jesus. Amen. The righteousness I stand in. It's not my human effort. It's not my human goodness. 
It's the grace of God. Amen. It's the glory of God. Man, you start measuring up Chad, he comes way short of anything, even remotely accepting of all the things God's given me. You say, well, what happens when you get to that place? I got to go calling and find my spot again. <laughs> Sometimes I got to shut up my flesh. Sometimes I got to say no. I got to turn that TV off and I got to silent my phone and I got to get away and get alone with God because I've gotten too far away from my spot in him. I've gotten too far away and I need to find it again. And I have to go and I'll crawl on my hands and my knees until I find it. But when I find it, I know I'm home. I know I'm there. I can feel him. I can hear him. I can sense where he's at. I can tell where he wants me to go. I can tell where he wants me to be, how he wants me to live, how he wants me to act. And then I know I'm home. This is my spot. This is where I belong. Amen. And it's a relationship thing. I know where I stand in God. I know where. We're going to get into it next week. But I know where my place is in him. Do you know where yours is? Have you spent enough time to find it? Because I'm telling you, if this is your spot in this world, just down here is in a church, you're missing so much more than what you could be. This is four walls, and I love it when the glory of God shows up. But I'm going to need God's glory tomorrow when you folks are gone and you don't gather here. When there is no piano behind me. When there are no words to sing off the wall. I'm just going to still need to stand in God. So i got to have a spot that I can go. i got to have a place. And I'm not talking about a physical place. If you want a physical place, that's fine. But in my heart and in my mind, i got to get with Him. i got to get with God. Because if I don't get with Him, I can feel myself sliding out of my spot. I can feel it. I can feel it in my heart. I can feel it in my mind. And before too long, if I stay too long over there, I'm going to start sinning. I'm going to start messing up. I'm going to start getting into my flesh and doing dumb things that I know I shouldn't be doing. This is why Paul said, I crucify the flesh daily. Why did Paul say that? Because Paul had found his spot. He said, I know where my place is. And I know if I don't make this flesh shut up and sit down, I'll lose it. I won't lose my spot in God, but I'll lose where I was. Amen. And I have to find my way back. I want to ask you this morning. If you're here under the sound of my voice or maybe even watching on Facebook somewhere in the world. Have you lost your spot? Have you allowed the devil to tell you that the glory of God, you're unqualified for it because of your behavior, because something that you've done in your past, that you can't find the revelation of God like other people because you're just not, quote, unquote, good enough. That's a lie. It's a lie from the devil. Amen. God's got a spot. God's got grace. God's got mercy more than we could ever fathom. And it's found in his glory. It's found in glory moments. And the more you get in those glory moments, the more that flesh dies. The more those hindrances slowly fade away. And I'm telling you, it's an everyday battle. It's not a one service kind of thing. It is an everyday battle to get to my spot because the devil tries so hard to keep me from it. My flesh fights so hard to keep me from it. To say no. No, 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 not today. You don't got time to pray today. You don't got time to read today. You don't have time to worship today. You don't, you don't feel like it. You're tired. It's been a long week. Surely God understands. Surely God understands that you're just weary and worn. And he'll understand if you just kind of take it easy and just mellow out in front of the TV. Man, God understands. He'll understand. No. It's pulling me away from my spot. It's pulling me away from where I need to be in God. The place he's designed me to be. So I gotta fight it every day. Every day. I gotta fight it. I gotta battle it and say, no, I'm not. I'm not going to let this world drag me away. I'm not gonna let sin drag me away. I'm gonna go to the grace of God. I'm gonna go boldly to the throne. I'm gonna stand on my spot in Him. And He's gonna strengthen me. He's gonna minister to me. And above all things, He's gonna shed His love on me. To 
where I know who I am when I leave, when I go to work, when I come to church. I know it. Amen? Every head bow, every eye closed. If you're here today, and you say, Pastor, I need to reclaim that spot. I've allowed things to take me from it. I've allowed things of the world to remove me from the place in grace I need to be. I've allowed distraction. I've allowed sin. I've allowed little things to pull me away. But I know I need to reclaim that spot that's mine. If you're here and say, yeah, Pastor, you're talking to me, then real quickly, will you raise your hand? Put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. God loves you. God cares for you deeply. Amen. He wants you to know you can come home. You had a lost your spot. It's still there. It's still there for you. He's made it for you. And he's just longing for you to stand there. He's longing for you to be there. And it'll be there for you for all eternity. I promise you. If you're here and you say, yep, pastor, that was me. And I want prayer. And maybe, maybe you say, I need prayer. You didn't preach on what I need, but you need prayer. Then I'm going to invite you.